them, and then I'll leave plenty of time for discussion at the end so we can have a conversation about next steps here. So what is a megasite? Whoops, let's click onto the presentation. It's, how do I get it back? There we go. I think we just need to have the, well, I recorded you. So because oh, for I those see. people that can't come, we are recording it and then we can send that. Perfect. Slide. Okay, so this slide just explains the folks that were on the team. These were the five students that helped us out. It's funny. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, and so we asked the students to propose a process for a Utah megasite program. So the background here is that um, states that have megasites programs are seeing deals that we're not seeing in Utah today. They're getting access to billion dollar scale um, infrastructure deals up to a thousand jobs that Utah is not competitive for because we don't have a program. So EDC Utah recognized this opportunity to try to create some inventory for these kinds of projects so that we'd have access to compete for them. Um, so we asked students to do five things. Start by benchmarking states that were doing this well. Um, propose Utah's own criteria based on that national information and interviews with local experts. And many of you, thank you, helped the students with that. Um, propose a certification process in Utah for um, getting a, a site to the point that we could market it. And then start to collect some inventory, uh, propose some sites around the state that might work for this program. Um, so in the process of interviewing experts, they met with folks from both the public sector and the private sector and tried to get a sense of what would and would not work um, for a program in our state. Whoops, Wes can see the video, but not the slide. Um, let's take off our video. Same with Sean. Okay, we're going to take off the webcam. Okay. Oops, I have to do. Okay, now now they have just the slides. Now, you, okay. I don't know how to get the other way without getting out of your. Let's see. Okay, let's back up. Okay. Every time I do that, I, apparently I have to have to move them off the screen like that. Okay, so um, is that working, everybody? Now, can you see her screen? Um, looks like not yet. Not yet. No. Hmm. Let's see. Slick, could I ask? Uh, I'm just gonna if I put that off. Slick, could you turn off your webcam, please? There we go. Did that work, everyone? No. We're on here. You need that screen. Let's try, yeah, that's, let's try that. Better? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's start over or just re reboot up your thing and pull it. Okay, so let's see if this works. Can you guys still see? Yes, thank you, Wes. Okay. So what is the definition of a mega site? We want a site that is deal ready. Let me be very clear. This does not mean that there's infrastructure to the site. It just means that the we're out of the I don't know business. We've answered the questions on how long it would take to get power and what it would cost and whether or not there's water and to what degree. We've just documented all the answers to the questions that are typically asked in a project. And then a company can decide whether or not they're willing to make the investment to put that infrastructure in. So again, we're not talking about billion dollar infrastructure on the front end, just the definition of what it would take to get the job done. So what did we learn about Utah's competitive position and, and whether this makes sense? Briefly, you can see from this map that uh, the brown states are the ones that have a state-sponsored megasites program and the blue one have some other kind of hybrid uh, megasites program. There's nothing in Utah, in, in Utah's neighborhood, with the exception of Wyoming. So uh, we are in pretty good position to compete if we could get a megasites program. We'd be the first real um, opportunity, I think, in the West and have opportunity to compete for folks who need Western distribution. So, so far, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is the student's presentation. So again, I'm catching up on all their animation. Um, within these states, there are about 113 sites certified today. 
So Utah has a real chance here. If, if we were able to certify a handful of sites, we'd be in the mix. Um, and in the last 10 years, there have been about 36 megasites projects done in the US. Um, so these are some competitive factors that our MBA student on the team put together. Uh, these are the kinds of companies, the scale of companies that use these kinds of projects. And again, we talked about the geography. We have an awesome manufacturing sector here in Utah. We have great talent for it and infrastructure for distribution. So we think that um, megasites have a real economic uh, opportunity for the state. So you guys have seen all this stuff. We'll zip through these. I think you all know that Utah is the best state for business. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the program. We asked the students to come up with some checklists that any community could use on their own or with an engineering consultant to um, hit the target for a, a shovel-ready, ready-to-market site. And we asked them to break it into two stages. And, and when we talk about stage one and stage two throughout this slide deck, stage one is kind of the stuff you can do from your desk. It's about a $10,000 investment if you were starting from zero to get all of that collected. Stage two is the boots on the ground. That's when you need engineers in the field taking measurements and actually figuring out um, the heavy cost of, of what that infrastructure is going to require. So these are the five categories, and we'll quickly step through each one and what the criteria the students are proposing we look for in each stage. So geographics, this is the map. This is the community area, the overview. So again, these stage one, um, the Phantom Mission's coming fast. These stage one, um, Criteria are the things that you should probably be able to do with your computer, and it shouldn't cost very much to put them together. You can do the research. You probably have most of this stuff already. Um, stage two, tax framework and or local incentives. I'll stop for a moment on this one because it was a bit of a sticking point for people. You know, We recognize that um, cities and communities can't commit local incentives up front. All we're asking is that you have some kind of a framework. So. Um, in the same sense that GoEd's EdTIF program has a framework, we know that the average deal is somewhere around 20% rebate for seven years, um, but there's a scale that the legislature has set out for that. That's the kind of understanding that we want to have in each community to know that incentives are available <clears throat> or not. And if the answer is there are none, that's okay too. We just need to have that answer before we go to the market. So ownership is the next one. The real um, sticking point here, these are large acreage sites, 400 acres or above contigu contiguous. Um, oftentimes that means there are a lot of owners and that can become a problem. So part of the homework that we want to do ahead of time is get that title report so we know who the owners are and have agreement among them that this property is ready to sell. So that is an upfront investment we need to make in order to go to market. Part of our piece on there. Okay. Okay. And then the next piece in stage two, um, this is the property survey. We want a two year listing price lock and a two year commitment to keep these acres together as a mega site. Um, but this was an area that we heard a lot of pushback from the private sector on where people want to be able to respond to market conditions. And so we're proposing that the final program have some kind of a clawback where. Um, you're locked in for two years if you take public money to finance this, assuming that we're going to have some kind of program to, to help uh, soften the blow here, but that there's a clawback that if you want to get out of it, you just have to pay the state back um, for the, the money that you borrowed, and then you can do whatever you want with the land again. We just didn't want to have state money setting up a mega site and then have somebody make it an industrial park to the state. We have no ROI. When you refer to state money, what state money are you? We don't know, Linda. That's an excellent <laughs> question. So, so you know, in some states, there's a like a revolving loan fund kind of a situation for mega sites where um, you can apply for a grant to help set up one of these sites. We don't have any money allocated to this yet. Let me be abundantly clear on that. Um, but we we think that's something that we should discuss over the next 12 months as we start to try to get our arms around a program. Um, and EDC Utah, you know, we'll speak with our board about perhaps, perhaps um, most of you guys are familiar with the match grant program at EDC Utah. That may be an opportunity for helping a community do the stage one piece, the, the $10,000 piece. Um, I don't know yet about stage two, although we did hear from the private sector that developers 
kind of consider that earnest money, we may be able to just get the private sector to help with that in some cases. Um, so to be continued, that is a very open question at this point. Um, and, and I should say, Clearly, this is not a program yet. This is still a proposal. And EDC Utah is in the process of putting together um, a steering committee who can kind of help us, uh, members of our board and members of the community, to help take a look at what these students have created, um, take a look at the two pilot sites that are going to start uh, certifying over the next few months, and figure out where we go from here. Anybody have questions on ownership? It's awfully strange to be presenting with no feedback, so please jump in if you guys have questions. Okay, uh, site development is the next stage. Again, the stage one are from your desk. You can provide the current zoning pretty easily. Stage two is where some of the big money comes into play. So this is where you need uh, a CRS or a Kimley Horn or some engineering group to do the, the studies, the phase one environmental, the archaeological report, archaeological report, geotechnical, those are the big questions that need to be answered to ensure that you can actually develop this site. Um, so EDC Utah, I, I want to thank CRS engineers, I don't know if they're on the call today, um, but they did some, uh, they volunteered their time to help the students kind of establish some of this criteria and vet it. Um, and I think they are working on at least one of the pilot sites and potentially the second one over the next six months. Um, but any engineering group can eventually do this once the criteria are finalized. So no questions yet. Thanks, John. <laughs> utilities. Again, map of all utilities. Uh, that's a pretty easy thing to gather, and Rocky Mountain Power and Questar can help with that. Stage two is where the engineers come in again. So this is the piece that we know some of these are going to be high dollar value answers. But when a company is putting in a billion dollar scale site, they're okay with spending a couple million to get power to it. So we just need to get estimates of, of what these things will cost to deliver and make sure there are no red flags on things that can't be delivered. Um, so again, the engineers are, are here to help on this one. And finally, transportation. So I want to point out rail on this one, we recognize that not every site in Utah is going to have rail availability, and that is okay. Um, we plan to go to market with, you know, not every client needs rail, so we think there'll be multiple um, sites in this plan, some with, some without. Um, but we do need to understand what it is if it's a rail serve site. And the rest of it is probably pretty obvious, uh, interstate and any kind of obstructions from bridges and underpasses for trucks. So potential sites. The students collected about 20 sites from around the state, thanks to you guys, uh, submissions from economic development directors uh, all around the state. And again, these are just proposed sites, um, and there may be many more throughout the state. But we'll run through a few of them, um, because I want to show you what we're going to try to create. So hopefully, we'll have an inventory of sites over the next couple of years where we can have a, a map that shows where they are, some major uh, site overview um, criteria, and then a readiness score. So this is, the idea for this readiness score is stage one, if you get everything in the stage one checklist, you know, that'll get to 100% and they'll switch to stage two. Uh, we don't have any sites in Utah that are in stage two right now. Everybody's some percentage of stage one. Um, but we have sites from counties statewide, you can see on the big map, uh, as far north as Box Elder, as far south as St. George, and pretty good spread east to west as well. So um, lots of opportunity here. And to Linda's point, these are all 400 acre and above sites. We're hopeful that if we get this dialed in for these big mega sites, that we can use the same criteria to create uh, another level for this program with smaller sites with, with smaller workforce requirements that would work in a larger um, variety of communities. So. Um, you guys are all going to get a copy of this. So uh, congratulations, Sylvia, because you had this, the biggest number here. 60% <laughs> complete was, was the highest that we uh, got in the student survey. Um, but you guys are going to get these slides, so I won't spend a lot of time going through all the individual sites that were submitted. Um, that's not the webinar. OK. Instead, let's jump to the certification process that the students are proposing. So. Um, 
we don't know who is going to own the stamp at the end of this program yet. Um, ideally, once this program is created, somebody is going to have the job of making sure these checklists are create, uh, complete, stamping it complete, and then um, monitoring, maintaining that inventory. And that could, be, um, that could be Linda, that could be me, that could be the power company, it could be a, a lot of different things. And that's part of what we want the um, steering committee to help us with. Um, so in this stage one process proposal from the students, they're using EDCU as that uh, entity that owns the Megasize program, but it might not be us. So just to be clear, they're using us as a placeholder here. Um, so one thing I want to be clear about is when uh, a site is presented, we want a single point of contact. We want a community a leader or somebody from the private sector to be the contact for the site. So every site that was submitted in that previous group, it had Sylvia Wilkins, Russ Fotheringham, Elise Earl, or somebody's name on it. Um, we need to have a community and all the people that touch a site. The students called it the municipality, the owner, and the broker, uh, the mob, M-O-B. <laughs> we want the mob to have a leader um, so that there's one message on each site. Um, so the initial screen, the mob can do pretty much themselves. I don't think you need to hire anybody for this. You probably don't even need an engineer. You guys will have access to all of that information, more or less, in your community. Um, and if there's anything you don't have and you need an engineer to find it, you know, we can make referrals for you. Um, so once the initial criteria is screened, you submit that application to us. That dotted stage one grant request is if we're able to, uh, EDC Utah is able to align the um, match grant program to to help with stage one. Um, and then EDC Utah, or whoever ends up owning this, would verify that you've completed stage one, and we'd move on to stage two. So stage two is the expensive part. Um, so obtaining funding, funding is going to be the responsibility of the, the mob, the municipality or the owner or the broker. You guys will have to get it funded. Potentially, there'll be funding for that, but we don't know what that looks like. To be very clear, those discussions are still happening. Um, once you have money to do it, you go ahead with the work. Um, and again, this is all happening with the lead on the project. Um, when your checklist is complete, you submit it to EDC Utah or whoever the owning entity is going to be to make sure everything is turned in. You know, we're not in the business of turning anybody away. Our job is once the site uh, criteria is agreed upon by all parties, we just make sure it's been completed. There's no, this isn't a good enough answer. This, this is not close enough to a freeway. This is not whatever. As long as everything on the checklist is answered, it's, it's done. It's, it's approved. And then companies can decide whether it's attractive or not. Um, so that's, that's our role is just to verify that everything's been tuned, turned in and there's enough information for a company to evaluate. So, um, this cost analysis, they're talking about the EDC Utah budget in terms of the uh, program management budget. We asked them to price out for us what they thought it would cost uh, to maintain a mega sites program wherever it's going to eventually live. So don't worry about the numbers on the EDC Utah task. That would, that would be on our side. Um, the engineering costs are what would be on the, the community or the broker or the uh, developer side. Um, so do you really think they can get that done for 10000 Because could they actually do um, all of the environmental no. surveys? No, this, okay. is, so just this is just stage one. one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay, that's good. Yeah, you're exactly right. <laughs> stage one is, you know, this is, we're in match grant territory, $10,000. We can okay. potentially help with that. Um, okay, so EDC Utah is considering maybe using the match grant yes. for this. Yes, okay. just Excellent. for stage one. Okay. Um, Stage two is the big dollar piece, and this is where you know we're going to have to figure out whether there's a public opportunity or not. And um, we had some input again from the private sector that suggested that it isn't unusual for a developer to be willing to put up six figures in order for a potential billion dollar you know project. So um, we need to do a little more work here. But this is this is the student's estimate of the cost. So. Um, again, that means the total cost of doing a site from soup to nuts, stage one, stage two, would be somewhere around $200,000 on the high end. Still no questions? Okay. So these are our questions. Um, these are the things that still need to happen. Who needs to sign off on the requirements and when? Where is this program going to live? Um, are we going to be able to use Megasite 
I'm sorry, uh, match grant money for stage one? Will there be any funding for stage two? Um, what are the parameters on making sure that municipal incentives are defined in stage one? Um, and what we have at the end of the pilot. So um, we have two communities, Utah County and Box Elder County, who are going to try to certify sites against this draft criteria. Um, and again, you know, this is this is still in the proposal stage. So they might get all the way through it, and and we might learn that some of these criteria are not quite what they should be, and we might have to tweak it at the end. But um, Russ in Utah County and Mitch in Box Elder County are are looking to. Um, test out this criteria for us over the next couple of months, and hopefully by midsummer, um, we'll have a pretty good sense of whether this is the right criteria. And in parallel, EDCU's soon-to-be-formed steering committee <laughs> will will start to um, advise on on where they think this thing should live and and how the funding might work out. Um, so that is the end of the slides. Um, how does the Q and A portion work? Is it text, or does anybody have discussion? If you want to ask a question, you can, um, we didn't mute anybody. You've just, I think, muted yourself. So if you have a question, please feel free to unmute. And then Justin Fisher says, how about Sitla land? So, so we'll start there. Thanks, Justin. The majority of the sites that were submitted were from a lease. So there's a lot of Sitla lands that have been submitted so far. That's absolutely an opportunity for many people. Yeah, Stephanie, this is Wes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, is rail a requirement and a certain distance from an interstate? Are there certain things like that that would be no. qualifiers in rural areas? No. So at this point, this draft criteria does not have disqualifiers. You just have to document what it is. So if it's not a rail serve site, we'll just say that up front. Or, you know, if it's going to cost $60 billion to bring rail, you know, we will that's just not going to be a rail surf site, but we'll let the companies make the decision. We didn't put a minimum distance to the freeway kind of requirement here. We um, just want communities to answer those questions and then let potential uh, client projects decide. Okay. Another thought I've got, I've been mulling this one over for a week or so, but are you familiar with the high cost infrastructure tax credit? I, Linda is the expert on that. I know that it exists. I am not an expert in that. Seems to me that this is something we ought to have EDCU market pretty extensively for rural Utah because half the costs of a lot of this infrastructure, rail, roads, water, electricity, gas, whatever the infrastructure happens to be, could come back to, to the uh, business in terms of a tax credit, and that's pretty significant. I wonder if we ought to have someone from the Office of Energy on that committee yes, as we get started, idea. because I think that's probably one of the biggest tools that we have for selling these properties. That's a great idea. Thanks for Thank bringing you, that up. So, so I, I'm seeing a question from Justin about the chicken and the egg problem of workforce. That's an excellent question, uh, and I don't have an excellent answer. Um, in the short term, when we're looking at trying to get this program piloted with the 400 acre and above, you know, those projects could potentially have a thousand employees. That might be a limiting factor for some communities. Um, but the idea is that if, if we can get this right with a couple of these big sites and then apply it to some smaller sites, the workforce problem, um, it, it becomes a smaller nut to crack. If we could certify sites that only need 200 employees, that would make this more accessible to all communities in Utah. I just want to mention something. When we had a meeting and introduced this a few weeks ago, um, one of the important points that was made was that we don't need to have 10 or 15 mega sites. We really only need three or four in the state. Put us on that map that Stephanie showed at the beginning. So we can have other sites that they will come to see, but it's these mega sites that the site selectors are being drawn toward right now. And so what we want to do is we basically want to put uh, bait out, I guess, project bait. Um, so we're encouraging of any community that can get this ball started. We're so happy to have Box Elder participating along with Utah, Utah County. So we have at least one rural mega site right off the bat. Sylvia, thank you for jumping right in and getting this going too. 
But please don't be discouraged if your communities don't have a, me a mega site. site. Um, let's start looking at whatever sites we have and then support the state and EDCU in their efforts to help get the attention of these site selectors toward, pointed toward our state. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, I don't mean to come off as tone deaf expecting that every community in the state could grab a thousand people and put them in a mega site. That, that's not the intention. Competing as a state, if we have a couple of these that can attract, you know, a billion dollar ROI on an investment, you know, that just gives us more, to Linda's point, uh, more visibility and um, gives site selectors a reason to look here and perhaps go down to a, a smaller site the next year on the next project. Anybody else? Okay, well, please, uh, you guys all have my contact information. Please feel free to call me if you have any follow-up questions separately. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Okay, and as we mentioned earlier, we, will, we are recording this session, and we also will be able to um, share the PowerPoints. And I'm going to change the screen quickly here to... Um, There we are. If I could ask one yes, go ahead. This, this is Steve Lund from Sampe County. And I'm wondering, I, I have county commissioners meeting this afternoon. Could I get a copy of this presentation between now and then? I will do everything within my power to, to get that available um, this morning. Okay. That I, okay. I would certainly appreciate that. And actually would you would you please text me your email and, and if we can't get it done for everybody by then, we can at least get you this PowerPoint um, immediately after this webinar. Do you have my email? Know. My email um, it, it's I, L, I, L Gilmore L G I L L M O R at Utah.gov. Got it. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for your interest, and we'd like everybody else Thank to share this too. Thank you. Okay. All right. I have. I do have one more question. Yes, go ahead. Um, for for some of these smaller businesses that that might be coming in if they're high tech, is there also a a, a potential list of interested venture capitalists or funding institutions that we could point some of these small businesses to? Would you repeat that? Was this for the question for Stephanie? I, I'm sorry, this is Steve Lund. I, I don't know who I'm really talking to. Okay. But my, my question on this is, as these small businesses look at some of these mega sites, is there any guidance from uh, Utah, Utah economic De from economic development as to funding sources within the state of Utah. Okay, I think first it's important to mention that on the mega sites, there was one screen at the beginning of Stephanie's presentation. We're looking at companies the size of Boeing, for example, with a okay. thousand jobs. So, so Certainly. they're, they're going to be um, their capacity for this type of thing is is going to be very um, advanced. And, and of course, the community that would have these sites would also be working hand in hand with both EDC Utah and GoEd. So there would be support. When we get into the smaller sites, um, that's a good conversation to have. Thank, thank you very much. I forgot about that first, uh, first slide. OK, keep asking questions or email questions. And if need, need be, we can leave this. Okay, let's see. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'm just going to, on the chat, um, okay. And while Stephanie's typing, that's her name, and she's going to put in her email for you. And then it looks like we have um, Commissioner Milne had had another comment. Okay, so this is Stephanie's 
Phone number, can you see that? 801-550-4718. I can. Okay, and then we're also going to go to her email, which is S. Froman, S F R O M S F R O H M A N at edcutah.org. And then, so there's her full name. And then, um, Commissioner Milne, did you, let's see, it says ditto, oh, applause. Oh. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, she needed that before she left. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments for Stephanie before she steps out? Okay, Tom, we're going to turn the, the screen over to you and move on um, for Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses. We are so excited to have this um, presentation to our rural partners. We've had a couple of businesses that it, it's actually a competitive um, program, but it has a value of $12,000. And we have had a few rural businesses that have participated in this and have done exceptionally well. So we look forward to having more interest in this. Um, and okay, Tom, I'm gonna mute myself and, and turn things over to you. Okay, can everyone see the slides okay? Yes. Do you want us to go video first or? Yeah, do you want us to start with the video presentation or you just want us to jump into the slides? Um, why do you why don't you go ahead and do the video presentation? I'm not sure if everybody watched their video presentation, but it's a quick precursor to this. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, just turn the camera. Okay. Go ahead and you're on. Are we on? Yeah, you're on. Okay. Hi, I'm Tom Longnecker, and. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program in the whole state of Utah. And Mike Banoff is here, and he'll also talk about the curriculum in the class. But just as a review, we just wanted to let you know, if you haven't taken a look at the, <coughs> excuse me, the four and a half minute video that we sent to you, um, go ahead and take a look at that, because that describes, it has the governor on it, and a couple of small business owners that are involved in the program. In the meantime, what I wanted to do was kind of share with you how the program got started for just a couple of minutes, then uh, Michael take you through the curriculum so that you can see a little bit more about it. Um, three and a half years ago, we started, four years ago, we started the program here in Salt Lake City. Uh, we're at about 7,400 businesses right now that have gone through the program nationwide, and uh, we have uh, the goal of getting to 10,000 probably in mid-19, or I mean 2018. Um, and the other thing we wanted to be able to do was talk to you a little bit about what the Goldman Sachs program looks like. Goldman Sachs invested about a half a billion dollars in the program. They went to 13 community colleges throughout North America and installed the program. The curriculum is written by Babson College in Boston. Um, they're an entrepreneurial college, the number one entrepreneurial college in America for the last 26 years. Um, they developed the curriculum that's a peer-to-peer -peer learning environment. So when we recruit for our, our cohorts, we recruit anywhere from 90 to 100 businesses each time. Uh, we ask them for some documentation on their business, a little bit about their financials, make sure they're a legitimate corporation and they have all their corp corporate documents with inside the state of Utah. And then we take that down to about 60, and then we interview those 60 and allow anywhere from 30 to 40 in the classroom. Uh, there's a couple of requirements for a business to be considered in this program. One of the requirements is uh, you have $150,000 a year in annual revenue. Do you have uh, at least three or four employees? Is there a growth opportunity? and have you been in business for two years. Uh, we don't do startup companies, we do companies that have the opportunity to grow and look forward to the future. And uh, we've had some great success stories. Uh, one of them is I had a cattle rancher a few years ago that was doing about $400,000 a year. He was third generation down in Springville um, and he wanted to grow. He graduated from Utah State University he was 28 years old, and so as we 
got involved in his business, we wanted to see where he wanted to go with his grass-fed beef uh, cows. And um, he's now gone in two and a half years, he's gone from 400000 to $26 million in revenue. And he has the potential to add 58 more million this year. So that's a phenomenal growth. We uh, secured Walmart. If you walk into a Walmart store, you'll see Jones Creek beef there now. And he's disrupted the whole market in that he doesn't sell beef per pound. He sells beef per cut. And so it was a whole new marketing opportunity to get involved in Walmart. And then we've had people like a little dog walker that came in that she was doing $150,000 in revenue. We helped her redefine her growth opportunity and a couple of other things. And she winds up now doing about $650,000, $700,000 a year. So our impact in the program is to really help small businesses grow. In our current cohort, we have uh, 39 scholars with a revenue base of about $78 million. And so far through the program, we've put in about $700 million worth of businesses that have identified their growth opportunity to be about $1.3 billion over the next five years. And so we're excited. Uh, the governor is excited over this program because it's a great opportunity to grow. Uh, when we're evaluated in our performance, we get evaluated in revenue growth and in job growth. Those are the only two things we monitor through the program is revenue. So as a company comes in and they're doing, let's say, $6 million, and at the end, they're doing $12 million 30 months later. That is actually the growth we're looking for and then how many jobs they created. We refer all of our clients to the SBDC so that they're all involved completely in that. And to discuss the rural part of the state of Utah, um, we've had scholars come as far away as Cedar City and St. George and come to our class. Uh, Michael talked about how often the classes are and what they look like. But we also have what's called a national blended program. And the national blended program is where you do it online from your local area. And then Babson College flies the scholar back to Boston, pays all their expenses, flies them back for two, two separate times and four-day events where they're actually on the college campus and they learn and they're taught by the faculty and, and the, the growth potential that they have. So uh, even in the rural parts of the state, they could still apply to the program. We get a lot of applications out of Idaho and Montana that are also involved in the program at the National Blended. And what I wanted to do was turn the time over to Mike so he could talk to you and we'll show you a couple slides about what the curriculum looks like, what these small businesses are learning, and the time commitment that's required. Thanks, Tom. You go to that. Yeah. Are there any questions so far from that section? I wonder if they're muted now. They can okay, we'll we'll continue on. This is how the module, we call them modules. This, each one is a class. So uh, if I say module, I'm referring to what you're looking at. If I say scholar, we're talking about a student. Um, I'm presuming you still have some of your Echo School of Business students there. If I could compare the level of curriculum, it's probably similar to what you study in that program. And what the, what the, I think the genius behind this isn't necessarily that uh, there's, you know, secret knowledge or, you know, specific things that we do in terms of curriculum. This is all um, what you're being taught now. However, it's the way that it's put together, it's sequenced, and then what we do with the businesses in between. So now imagine... Uh, 30 to 40 business owners in a classroom. We use peer-to-peer -peer teaching techniques, so we encourage the person sitting next to a scholar to, you know, chime in. They may have a, a particular experience that would be helpful, such as, you know, uh, a insurance problem, maybe the cost of workman's compensation, maybe there was a claim, uh, their scholar or their cohort on the right-hand side of them says, we'll try this. 
So we use that heavily as we progress through the sequence of modules. Each one of those modules is a week apart. So, for instance, we will do module two, then skip a week, module three. It's an all-day class, and so on. So we progress down through those subject items. Uh, what this is, uh, when I did my master's work, it, uh, you know, you do a deep dive into a particular case study, the Harvard Business School method. My case study was Scott Fertilizer Company. And so I became quite skilled at understanding Scott Fertilizer's um, management methods. What we use for the case study in this example is the scholar's own company. And we go through each one of these areas of discipline in a deep dive sense, and we extract from the business owner their particulars, find their weaknesses, find their strengths, and build the curriculum as we progress. The idea is, at the end of this, to have a growth plan. That's different than a business plan or a marketing plan, but it's a plan to scale the business. And that's not always uh, real clear or evident. We see a lot of our applicants that will reach, uh, met with one yesterday, they hit, a, they hit kind of a plateau. Uh, a company that installs lightning rods is one of our uh, uh, candidates or one of our scholars at the moment uh, can't get past that $20 million mark. And so we go in, we figure out what will, given growth and opportunities, or perhaps employees, or perhaps their marketing, how, or their processes. How do we then grow? And we focus that curriculum on those things that helps the company grow to a predetermined level. We bring in the faculty. We have a Disney entrepreneur in residence. We have a farmer bank uh, president. Uh, operations and processes. We have various consultants come in who identify uh, and are skilled in such items as just in time or uh, various, you know, current thought on how do you improve a sequence? Uh, is the sequence necessary? Where is redundancy required? And so on. So between those modules that you see, uh, we have four clinics. We review financial statements. We show the business owner how do you turn those into a an actual tool. The lender clinic, we have our scholars assume the position of the lender and other scholars in the class then come in and apply for a loan. So we let our scholars take the position of the lender so we can see if they are bankable or what needs to improve. The legal clinic, uh, Goldman Sachs brings in 15 highly paid attorneys who then dispense employment law uh, at request, no charge to the scholar. And then we do some negotiation uh, vignettes and samples. Uh, between those modules, we have business advice. I'm one of those. Tom is one. We visit each scholar's business. We learn their processes. We look at we meet the people. And at that point, then we start to this curriculum directly to the business uh, enterprise. Uh, so that lasts about 14 to 15 weeks, and then you become a, or the business owner becomes a member of the alumni. We literally will have 10,000 businesses as alumni, which is it almost becomes an economy of its own, and. There's uh, networking access. A lot of our scholars end up doing business with each other. So it's pretty cool. Are there any questions? I don't know if, if we can. Can we hear the questions? They can type them in the chat. Oh. OK, that's essentially the curriculum. And I must, uh, 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 I, I must excuse myself. I have to go to a, a scholar meeting. We're meeting, I'm meeting with a gal who creates baby hats. And she is expanding 
into the western U.S. and who who would believe you could walk a dog or make hats for babies in the millions of dollars in revenue? So anyway, that's that's the curriculum portion. Have we got questions there? See, how often do graduates meet with SLCC after the series of classes? The uh, it's a good question. SLCC is the host university, and it doesn't have any tie other than the, the scholars. Uh, we dispense the program here. The alumni meetings are held at various places at the discretion of the alumni. Generally, the alumni manager has four formal events a year or, or quarterly. And they're a lot of fun, a lot of uh, business is done. For instance, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of Kimmy's Chop House. It's down there in Sugar House. She's one of our graduates. And so we meet there occasionally. By the way, we've had four scholars go through Shark Tank, and three of them did deals with Mark Cuban. I, I think the question is also, how do we deal with somebody after they're done with the program? Um, during the program, in the initial stages, when they're in Mod 2, they actually sign up with the local SBDC in their area. And what we do is they are turned over at the end of the program here. They're turned over to the SBDC to help them protect or perfect their growth plan. And they become impact clients of the SBDC. And when they go throughout this growth segment, SBDC gets all the credit for them. Uh, we don't worry about that uh, during. The only thing that happens for us is six months after they graduate, 18 months after they graduate, and 30 months after they graduate, we ask them for some measurement on their business. And then we evaluate it so that we can come up with the data that we need to determine the effectiveness. And as a business advisor, we're free to the business. There's no cost in this whole program to the business. Uh, the business advisor is in their business about eight times during the 16, 14 to 16 weeks, in there talking to them, giving them another set of eyes, helping them learn certain resources that are available throughout the state of Utah, uh, anywhere from government procurement to manufacturing expertise to all the things that would help uh, uh, the scholar uh, grow. And I think the thing that's really important to understand throughout this program is that they are not writing a growth plan for us. They're writing the growth plan for their own business, for their own expertise, we affectionately say this is like them getting a mini MBA on their own business because we think that the amount of time that they put in, it takes about 100 hours during the 15 weeks, 14 weeks, and it includes uh, some out-of-class discussion and some other things. The group as a whole, they set the culture of the classroom. They set the opportunity to be able to grow. The communication and the peer-to-peer -peer learning environment uh, Babson has been great at coming up with the curriculum. And as uh, Mike talked about, none of our classes are taught by anybody in a theoretical sense. They're all taught by a practical sense in how you're going to deploy metrics and tactics. And we want to be able to do that through the community college setting. Uh, the foundation, the Goldman Sachs Foundation, actually pays a grant to Salt Lake Community College that allows for them to hire us and to be taught. Uh, we all went through a big screening process. We all have MBAs, and uh, we are there to be able to help these businesses grow. Are there some more questions there? Um, no. No more questions. Either we did a really good job or it doesn't interest you. <laughs> so the most important thing that we have here is applications are being accepted right now. Cohort number 14 uh, starts in August of 2017. The application deadline is May 5th. We've already recruited approximately 25 to 30 scholars for that pool, so we have about 60, 70 more to go. And then a uh, final cohort uh, for our funding through this program is cohort number 15. The application deadline is November 13th, and it starts a year from now and will be done by April, I think it's 20th of 2018. So those are the two application statuses. If you have a business that's in the rural area and they want to be able to apply uh, and not come to SLCC but be in the National Blended Program, 
they apply at that uh, 10 KSB apply at the bottom, and that they sign up that they want to be in the national blended program, and uh, then that affords them the opportunity. There's about a hundred and fifty in each online course that does that, and that's the one that includes uh, two trips back to Boston. So I hope that helps. If there's not any questions, uh, we'll turn it back to you. Okay, this is Linda. I just want to make one other comment. Um, this is, in a way, these are limited opportunities for all of us in rural Utah and for the state because we don't know what kind of funding will be there afterwards. And so I would strongly encourage you to, to look for those companies that are ready to grow but need the more nurturing and mentoring in addition to that information. But the mentoring opportunities in these programs are out incredible. Um, I did talk to one of the companies that came out of Fillmore, and I said, did you mind driving up to Slick every uh, other week? And, and he said, no, absolutely not, because it helped me get away from my business so I could think about my business instead of putting out fires every day. And he enjoyed making friends along the Wasatch Front and with businesses around the state where he felt like he could speak freely about his challenges um, and, and share solutions with, with other businesses. But we also would like to try some of these, um, the, the long distance learning too, and see if that would be a better way to help our rural businesses. So please use that link to the, um, to the YouTube video that, that Tom sent out earlier, and that was in your invitation to the webinar. And um, we will have links that we'll send out again for this recording. And we'll also have these PowerPoints that we'll send out. So please feel free to distribute this information. And Tom, do you have any other comments? Um, or does anyone well, have We have another question here, too. Yeah, yeah, there is a question. Go ahead. It's Brian Stark. What is yeah. the Go ahead. Okay. What is the best way to educate our businesses besides personal visits? Do you travel around the state to present to local businesses? Um, well, we're so busy with uh, doing outreach as well as the um, uh, classes. We run three 16-week classes, so you can imagine 14 to 16 weeks, so you can imagine the time element that we're in the classroom. And during between each classroom visit that they make, uh, they're meeting with a business advisor. So we haven't done as much on the road as we could. Uh, there's some opportunities that might present themselves uh, between the next uh, year because, as you can see, we're only recruiting two left now as, as on, that, uh, on the screen. So that should uh, give us a, a few extra hundred hours maybe to start going through the state and holding some mini seminars on this uh, because the big question with us is sustainability. Uh, once we reach 10,000, what will Goldman Sachs want to do or will the governor want to do something? We're not sure yet but we're just uh, barreling ahead as fast as we can with these last four cohorts that we have right now. Uh, the thing that's interesting about the mushroom company that you talked about down in Fillmore, I was the business advisor there, and when we actually looked at his profitability, it was uh, when I toured his facility and went through his facility, uh, we broke it down to how many pounds of mushrooms he could grow per square foot. And he was growing about 4.18 pounds of mushrooms. And so we said, well, if you could get the yield up, you would use less bedding materials, you would use less labor, and all the things that we looked at. And so we got him up to 6.2 pounds per square foot, and it had a million dollar impact to his bottom line. He became a million dollars more profitable. So. In his case, it wasn't about growing yet, it was about becoming profitable. And so now since he's profitable, spent the last year becoming profitable, now he can start to grow. And he wants to grow to about $14, $15 million in the next three or four years. And so there's a great opportunity there for us to assist in the process. It's not all growth development, it's all about how we can scale the growth for their company through their financial resources. and how fast they're going to be able to do that so that they don't run out of cash or don't run out of the resources that they currently have. Excellent. So, uh, that's, a great, that's a great scholar down there in Fillmore. We're, 
we're excited that he, he made the effort to come because it's changed the destiny of his business. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll see more applications coming from rural Utah. We'd like to see more rural businesses in these last two cohorts. Um, it would be nice if, if we can show the state that we have a, a demand for this. Um, I think there's a, the chance of getting this a continual funding would, be, would increase. Um, but I think the only way that we're going to get that rural demand is if we get the word out. So as I said before, please feel free to share these PowerPoints and the link to both their YouTube video and also to this presentation if somebody wants to watch it and have that explanation as they go through the PowerPoint. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Any other comments before we sign up off from rural Utah? All right. We had 21 attendees today, Tom, so that's that's good. We'll get this shared throughout all, all of our contact lists. OK, thank you.